Welcome back to the program today, folks. I'm very excited to be able to speak with uh, Luke Vandeway. Uh, Luke is a New Testament scholar. He's written several books. And as I was uh, speaking with him earlier, uh, this book that he's written, uh, his latest the historical tale, and we'll put this in the show notes. Uh, got some card players there, poker, an allusion to poker here. Um, but it's just a, it's a great book. It's thoroughly researched. It's a book that a, uh, theologian could read or a lay person could read both, uh, very in-depth and, uh, just very insightful on a lot of the things that he brings out, uh, as far as Luke, uh, the gospel, uh, that Luke wrote and, and even the book of Acts, the continuation of that, uh, and I, the subtitle is Patterns of Eyewitness Testimony in the Gospel of Luke and Acts. And so, Luke, I just want to thank you for your time today, sir. And it's a, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to speak with you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Before we get into the book, maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, yeah. I, uh, I didn't grow up in a, in a Christian home. My parents became believers uh, later in life, so about in their, in their early 40s. So when I was a teenager, my mom uh, became a believer, and then a few years later, my dad, through apologetics, uh, became a Christian, and I myself didn't become a Christian until I was 17, and that was really through just a, a number of events. But, uh, you know, aside from that, I had a really great upbringing. My parents were terrific, very involved. Uh, I still, I'm still very close with both of them. Um, we actually moved over from the Netherlands. Uh, my, I have an American accent, but I, because I, when we moved, I was only eight, but uh, I did grow up early on in the Netherlands and my parents moved over. My dad was in the kind of computer uh, programming aspect and, and this was all during the dot-com boom. So we kind of rode that wave and always wanted to go to the U.S. So it was through a different set of events that we ended up here. My parents ended up becoming believers and then yeah, as I mentioned, I eventually did as well, and so did my other two siblings. Um, yeah. Hmm, praise God. And what about your background? I know you're a, a New Testament scholar. Where where did you study, and where where did you uh, get your degrees? Yeah, so I uh, I did my degrees really on the side while I had my career. So I, I have a career in property development, and um, I've been working on my careers for or on my degrees for uh about 12 or 13 years so I did a yeah yeah it's kind of a slow slow road you know I I got married and I wanted to have time to spend with my kids and give us a stable background and so for me the theology was always something I did on the side it was my passion and uh to me that's actually been a real benefit because I've never had to do it because I've had to you know I've chosen to do it because I wanted to um, and that went on for a long time. So initially, when I was in my early 20s, I thought about going into the ministry. And so, of course, naturally, you go and you get your MDiv. So I went to a small reform seminary. I lived near Seattle. So uh, in Tacoma, they, they had a small reform seminary where I got a master's degree. And then uh, upon re reflection, I realized, you know, the pastorate is a lot harder than I thought it was. And it really takes a certain type of personality. And that wasn't really mine. And at the same time, because my dad came to faith through apologetics, I kind of I kind of always had that like intellectual side of me. And so I decided, you know, I learned Greek, you know, I've, I've done the language courses. Let's just keep going. And so I got an additional master's degree there, uh, focusing more on research. And even then I started publishing in, in some New Testament journals and uh, doing a bit of apologetics. I debated Michael Shermer and, and, uh, I realized, I think, after that debate and during that time, I just finished my master's degrees and debated Michael Shermer, and I really wanted to contribute to the field as a scholar versus merely being um, an apologist. And there's nothing wrong with apologetics at all, but it's a different thing. You know, I think if you're an apologist, you're taking kind of the cream of the crop uh, of the best arguments that New Testament scholars have, and then you're really like dissecting that and presenting it and that's of course something I'm doing and like I did that recently in our in the in the, the video series with Cameron Bertuzzi but I also wanted to actually be engaged in the peer-reviewed literature 
and B, not just using the material from New Testament scholars, but actually contributing to that field. And since I was already publishing, uh, it wasn't too hard for me to get into a program. So I got into a program from the UK, uh, University of Aberdeen, and uh, focused on New Testament. And took me about, it's a six year program. So it's a part time program, but I did it in uh, three and a half years. So I kind of skated my way through it. And, uh, and the historical tell came out of that, those few years of studying there at the University of Aberdeen. Hmm. That's great. Yeah. It's a, it's a story, you know, I think I can relate to, you know, as a businessman and, uh, you know, when I'm in these, uh, seminary classes, I've got them on my last course to get my master's degree. You know, everybody looks around like, you know, what, what are you doing in here? You know, you're supposed to be a pastor or associate pastor, you know, that, that sort of thing. So that's cool. That's cool. With you. Yeah. But I think, you know, I think from a historical perspective, it's not unusual to yeah, at all. I was a tent maker. Yeah, it's not unusual to be a tent maker. You know, that's been the way of things for a long time. So I actually like it. I think I think both models are great. If you if God's called you to full time ministry, that's wonderful, you know. But if God's called you to be a tent maker, I think you can be a real asset to the church from that perspective as well. So it doesn't matter, you know, exactly what background or age, you know, I have a lot of background in construction. I literally do carpentry you know, most of my days, but in the evenings, that doesn't stop me from doing serious theological work, you know, so. Man, that's cool. Well, uh, before we get into the book, let's just talk about the cover, the historical tale. Are, are you a poker player? You know, you I'm actually the cards not. here, man, you know, huh? This... Yeah, I'm not a poker player. I'm actually really bad at bluffing. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm horrible. Uh, so no, I played very little poker. If I did, I would be a very bad poker player. But um, as I was putting my, I wanted to con you know, condense my PhD research and make it presentable. And so naturally you send your manuscript out to some others to review. And so Paul Barnett, who's one of the scholars who reviewed my book, he's like, hey, you know, you should try to capture what you're doing in kind of this, like a simple image or like a metaphor. And I really thought that like a poker player's tell was really fitting because I look at all these unintentional cues in Luke's text that are very subtle and uh, would be difficult for Luke to fake. And so it just matched really well with this idea of like, you know, what are the cards Luke is holding rather than just taking the church's authority on who Luke was and what he did. Instead, let's like look at these cues in Luke's text, kind of like to tell and see what's really going on. Yeah. Well, I, I like the image and that he's actually showing the three aces. And yeah, I would think in my mind, you know, uh, you would take the, the image would be from behind, like, and he would have the cards that were he's sh looking at his own cards, but you've got them flipped. So very clever on the design on that. So. Yeah, we, we played around with it a little bit because we didn't, you know, we didn't want them to look like, uh, like, was it tar the tarot cards? You know, the, we, we wanted to make sure that people were clear what they were. And we wanted to put the Byzantine apostle images on there as well. So people could get a sense. This is like not really about poker. <laughs> you know, uh, it's not about like getting odd readings. It's about new testament stuff and so we played around with the image quite a bit it was actually great working with deward they're a very small uh publisher uh, they publish a lot of lydia mcgrew's books and uh and but they're great to work with because they really have that personal element and they're very responsive to like what an author thinks and and wants to do and so they were willing to play around we played around with about four or five different designs and uh ended up with that one i, I really like it yeah they hit the nail on the head yeah. Well, let's let's get into it. So you've got uh, five different patterns here, and um, the first pattern you have is a pattern of names, uh, and you actually have a kind of a specialty in this. Is see if I'm pronouncing this right. Onomastics. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, let's just begin with that and talk about names. I know you mentioned there's like uh, Luke has, I believe, 127 different names in the Gospel of Luke and Acts, and what the yeah. significance of that is and how uh, that plays into this being, you know, more than just a, a fairy tale, but accurate historically and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the kind of topic where like, I've been in it so much, you know, sometimes I go to 
you know, like family gatherings and someone, you know, a distant relative will ask me, you know, like what I'm up to. And then I'll start talking about this and it's kind of like, you know, buckle up buttercup because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've been in this way too long and I'm always <laughs> hesitant to like talk way too much about it. It's fascinating. And I'm continuing to do peer reviewed research on this. And so the gist of the argument is that you can look at the the population distributions in the Gospels and Acts or in Luke and Acts. And, you know, you're going to get a certain amount of popular names like Simon and Joseph. You're going to get some rare names, you know, like Nicodemus or Cleopas. And the argument is that when you compare these distribution ratios with, with the distribution ratios of the general population that we know of from other databases that we have access to, the the ratios between like the more popular names and the and, and and the rarer names match the ratios in the that we know are in the actual population. So it's like a really subtle, and this goes into that poker players tell idea. It's a really subtle pattern that would have been really difficult for them to uh, have realized they were, you know, they were not copying if they were making it up. And it's actually just a really powerful piece of evidence. And so what I've actually started to do, what I talk about in the historical tell is that I, I discuss that pattern that so you have these, I call it automatic congruence. When you have patterns in the gospels and acts that correspond with the general population. And I ask the question, you know, whether this is a feature of historiography or if this is something that could be faked by ancient you know, historical novel writers, for example, in antiquity, or the apocryphal gospels or whatever. So I I researched 25 extra biblical works and did an analysis on their naming patterns. And the conclusion of that portion of my argument was that when you have these correct and intricate naming patterns, like you have in Luke, like you have in the gospels and Acts generally, that's a feature actually of like historical reportage. And I don't go into this part in the book because this is new, but I'm actually I've been working with a statistician to develop this argument more. So we've actually made this into an official statistical argument and compared uh, the the distributions in the Gospels and Acts, even to uh, like other like modern historical novels like Ben Hur. You know, because we really want to see like could these types of patterns be mimicked by fictional writers? And so we go through like three or four different examples, trying to find the best case scenarios of like. Well, what if they had access to Josephus or or what if they were, you know, they had access to like earlier writings or, you know, like what what do the best case scenario? Like, could they mimic these types of naming pattern distributions? And uh, the answer is no. Like, it's just that we have no evidence of any non-fictional work being able to have accurate naming patterns like we have in the Gospels and Acts. So that's kind of the gist of my argument. Uh, but I spent years on this. I mean, this is like what I just said is like three to four years of research and thinking about this issue. I think, and there's a reason I name it first. I think this is one of the most fascinating and interesting and powerful arguments for the authenticity of the Gospels and Acts. Yeah. And and I like, I think you call them distinguishers, like the names that are more common, that are higher percentage, we would say, they tend Luke tends to put something after the name like to to let you know that this was this particular person instead of just throwing a general name out there like sure. Simon. You know, there, sure. there's maybe comment on that distinguishing aspect of of the names. Yeah. So the the disambiguators, yeah. And that's actually what that's what Peter Williams calls them. So, and there's been a few other scholars who have done work on this. Richard Bauckham was the pioneer of the argument, and then Peter Williams has done a little bit of work uh, later on. And so the disambiguation element of the argument comes from Peter Williams. And I've also sharpened that a bit in my forthcoming peer-reviewed article. Pretty much um, about 75% of the names in the Gospels and Acts, or 90, it depends on what criteria you use, uh, somewhere in that range of 75% to 90% of, of persons in the Gospels and Acts whose names are disambiguated, like uh, Simon Peter, you know, you mentioned that, you know, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. So Jesus and Simon are both popular names. 
75 to 90 percent of names that are disambiguated are like the top five names they're the most popular names and so that is another element like a feature of the accuracy of naming patterns that would be quite hard to mimic if you were if you were not aware of what like the popularity percentages were because naturally like in the population um, you would need to distinguish one Simon from another or one Joseph from another because there's so, and this is actually a unique situation in among Jews in Palestine. Uh, I think like the top nine names were held by like 30% of males. So you had these very few names that were incredibly popular, you know, and so pretty much generally and quite consistently when a character or, or a name person in the gospels has one of those common names, they're disambiguated, which is what you would expect if this was authentic historical reportage, because you'd have to disambiguate the common ones. But then when you have rarer names like Nicodemus that I mentioned earlier, or Cleopas, they don't have disambiguators. So that's just one other, there's many layers to this argument. And so there's even really cool other little intricate patterns like Jesus, Peter Williams mentions this too, but if you look at all the gospels, and I don't think I mentioned this in my book, but Jesus is not disambiguated typically by the gospel authors in their narration, like when they're just writing from the perspective of, you know, the narr narrating the accounts. So like when Mark is introducing Jesus or, or Matthew or, or, or Luke is just, you know, giving some context, he'll just call Jesus, Jesus. But when the name Jesus is put on the lips of a person in the narrative in a public scenario, they almost always disambiguate Jesus, whether it's Jesus of Nazareth or, you know, Jesus son of David, and so that's exactly the type of pattern you would expect if it's authentic reportage. Because of course, like in the in if you were like walking down the street there, you'd have to disambiguate who Jesus was, because there might have been like five or six Jesuses in the crowd, but the gospel authors in the narration wouldn't disambiguate because they knew what Jesus they were talking about. And so you get these very subtle patterns like that too. And all of it kind of points back to this authentic. Uh, unvarnished picture of historical reportage that the Gospels and Acts give us. Uh, and of course, especially Luke as well. And I go into that more as the book goes on. Yeah, it's, it's, as you read, as you read the Gospels, it, it really made, made me pay more attention to the names and how it just layers upon it. Um, you know, it, which leads into the next <clears throat> uh, tale is, uh, vivid detail and really, I guess, eyewitnesses. You know, we Luke uh, begins, he talks about the eyewitnesses and those who are ministers of the word and just the accounts. So maybe let's move on to number two then. Sure, yeah. And so since I, I start off generally talking about the Gospels and Acts naming patterns, and then as the tells go on, I focus more specifically on Luke. Because like you mentioned, Luke, says in his prologue, or he very strongly implies that he interviewed eyewitnesses. And the majority of Lucan scholars, you know, concede this is the implication of Luke's prologue, you know. And so the second tell I look at is then uh, patterns of vividness when Luke is present with Paul in the book of Acts. So um, in the second half of the book of Acts, there are three or four B passages, depending on how you count them. And this is simply when Luke implies that he's there with Paul by either she switches the verbal form in Greek, or, you know, he just specifies that, hey, rather than they went here or there, we went here or there. And it's in those three to four passages where the vividness of Luke's account significantly increases. And then especially in the last we section, which is in Acts 27, where Luke recounts this really detailed and long count of a voyage and a shipwreck, where it gets really, really in depth as far as like the detail that Luke has. And, and very many of those elements can now be corroborated. So like even just like the direction that, you know, that Luke describes the ship going along the coast there of Southern Asia Minor, Luke mentioned that they transfer a ship in a particular town, for example, and we know that that's actually where they would store the grain. There, there was grain storages there. So it makes sense that a ship from Alexandria, because they would have these corn fleets or grain fleets that would take uh, grain and corn from uh, Alexandria and Egypt up to Rome, because obviously they got to feed, you know, I got to feed the, the monster up, <laughs> up there. And so this is the route they would take. And it makes perfect sense that they would transfer the ship there because they were dropping off their load, right? And then picking up another one to take over to Rome. And 
there's several places that Luke mentions that only Luke actually has correct from a geographical perspective. Uh, Laosia is one of those towns. I also mentioned Kata in the book. It's this little island uh, south of Crete. And Luke is the only geographer or the only writer who has the location of his island right. So uh, Pliny, Pliny the Elder, for example, and Ptolemy, they, they mention this island, but they get the location wrong. Only Luke mentions the island as the location right. And you can just go on and on and on. The point is that you have this intense increase in vividness and detail and historical accuracy in the very places where Luke puts himself as a companion of Paul. And that's relevant to the eyewitness question because if you follow the we sections through, like in Acts 27, for example, Luke is taking a voyage from uh, Caesarea to Rome. Uh, well, the last we section ended in Jerusalem two years prior. So that implies Luke has been in the vicinity of Jerusalem for two years. Well, if Luke is saying he interviewed eyewitnesses, it puts him like in the proximity, you know? So if you're looking at it from like a detective perspective, you know, we want to look at like means, motive, and opportunity, right? Luke has stated his motive, like in his prologue, here's, here's an example of opportunity Luke would have had to interview eyewitnesses. So that's the second tell. And it begins to build this picture of Luke uh, as someone who interviewed these persons that he names in various places in his text. Yeah, I think the the we sections and, and Acts, uh, for those who would say, well, you know, Luke was a third or fourth generation believer and removed from all this, it kind of blows that, <clears throat> blows that theory out of the water for me. Oh, it does for me too, you know, and Colin Hemer did a lot of work on this in the 1980s. He was a British scholar. He died fairly young of cancer. I think he was in his 50s. But uh, yeah, he wrote an article in the Tindo Bulletin on this. And he also, uh, after his death, another scholar published his works on it. I think it's called, his book is called The uh, the Book of Acts in the Setting of Hellenistic History. He's really the main scholar on this. But to me, like reading, he goes into even more detail than I just mentioned. I mean, I could talk easily for 20 minutes on just the details from Acts 27. That he that he's found corroborated and and you know through epigraphical material and other other source documents, and to me reading that it's like wow, if you want to go out and argue that Luke was not present here, you really have to start jumping through some serious hoops because you know and scholars will do this. So there's some skeptical scholars who would say wow, this this account is so accurate, Luke must have used like a travel log from somebody else, you know <laughs> you know and then like copied it in. Whereas like. The, it's by far the most natural reading is, you know, you follow the we sections. It has a it has a geographical journey. It's very natural, you know. And then in those very places, Luke increases his detail. Uh, there's nothing in the style of writing that would indicate that Luke was not the author of the we passages. So in other words, the syntax, the type of of patterns that Luke typically has in the way that he writes, they're no different in those sections. And so you you really can't avoid the fact that wow. Luke implies he's present and all the evidence points to the fact that he was. And that has a lot of implications, like you say, for because it puts Luke not just in the physical proximity of Paul, it puts Luke uh, chronologically within the time of living memory when he could have been interviewing all these eyewitnesses. So I think those first two tells together are the most significant from the research that I've done. Once you realize that these patterns of names are really a feature of ancient historiography. That's simply what they are. Once you yeah. acknowledge that, and then you see Luke placing himself as a historian through his prologue, interviewing eyewitnesses. So you have that's that's one piece. And then you have the we passages where Luke is so evidently present and putting him in the proximity of eyewitnesses. And I think those two pieces together already give you so much confidence that what Luke is writing is true. You know, he did what that he did. Yeah. Yeah. I think just to, the average layman, when they pick up the, the gospel and read Luke or Acts, it, it just comes across as real and authentic and um, not not make believe like, you know, some of the apocryphal gospels or some some other writings. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll kind of deviate here a little bit. I know you got three more style convergence and connectivity here, but. A part that really jumped out at me is when you did the maps, uh, you call it uh, Luke's travel narrative. Uh, 
uh, sort of with Elijah, Elisha, so forth, and how they that travel really overlaps. I just have never looked at that that way, and that was just really eye-opening to me. Not only the visiting the same towns, but performing the miracles, the, the raising of the dead, uh, uh, you know. So I could go on, but I'm, I'm going to let you go on from there. Sure, yeah. That's actually something that no one else has asked me about, <laughs> the, the, the travel narrative portion. It's one of the later chapters in my book, and it came out of just, you know, sometimes what will happen while I'm researching is I'll run into something, and I'll just want to dig into it until I have it resolved. And there's been a lot of questions over Luke's geography when it comes to Jesus's travels to Jerusalem. And the problem really is that when you get to the kind of the hinge of Luke's gospel, so like uh, in chapter nine, you know, verse 51, 52, that's really when Jesus begins this really long journey to Jerusalem, which Luke articulates. And Luke mentions right there in the beginning that Jesus, he, he steadfastly sets his face to Jerusalem. Like Jesus is going here. Okay. The problem then is like when you, and Luke mentions this several times as he goes through, like in between that verse and then, you know, when Jesus enters Jerusalem, Luke is saying Jesus is, he's, he's heading to Jerusalem. He's got his face set to Jerusalem. He's traveling steadfastly to Jerusalem. The problem then is that when you actually trace the locations on a map, of where Jesus is going, according to Luke, he kind of goes in like a strange, almost like an, like for the shape of like an eight. Like he doesn't go directly at all. And in fact, he loops down below south of Jerusalem and then he goes across the Jordan and then he's back up. And then he ends up at, back at the border of Galilee and Samaria, like up north. And so a lot of scholars have simply said, I know Luke doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't have any idea about the geography of Galilee and, and Judea. Or, which has become more popular now, well, Luke just didn't care about the geography. Luke was doing this you know, theological work, and he just kind of like, just didn't care about it. And so, one thing I noticed was that Luke has a really strong focus on presenting Jesus as an Elisha, Elijah-like prophet. Right at the very beginning, where, where, where Luke introduces Jesus in Nazareth, you know, he has Jesus pretty much, you know, compare himself to Elijah and Elisha. And then especially in the travel narrative, like when it begins, at the very beginning, there are three references like in a row to either Elijah and Elisha's, you know, the way that they started their ministry or even using words from the Elijah-Elisha narrative. And like other scholars have pointed this out. And so I thought to myself, well, this is kind of interesting. You know, Luke has apparently has been uh He's been influenced by traditions that show Jesus kind of presenting himself as an Elijah-like prophet. And so what's really fascinating then is if you take that journey from Luke's gospel, the, the travel narrative, and you combine it with uh, parts of John's gospel where John is describing Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem, and you put them together— so it's very implicit, it, it's, it's subtle, it's unintentional, but when you actually map them onto one another— and then you take that journey, which, like I said, almost looks like it's it's very kind of convoluted and and messy. But when you put it over the Elijah Elisha journey from the books of Kings, it's almost a perfect match. In other words, Luke Jesus in Luke's gospel is retracing, it appears, the journey of Elijah and Elisha when Elijah was taken up into heaven. Which so when when Luke describes jesus's journey to jerusalem he 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 says that he says it's it, it's it, jesus is starting his journey to jesus's assumption going up into heaven and so he already uses the word that compares it to elijah so it's really cool then to see the match right on top of one another and so i talk about like, what is the best explanation for this and i simply think that this is another clue that Luke is reporting what Jesus did in the same way that that Jesus uh, performed many actions that reflect the, like the works of Moses. You know, he's he's giving the law upon the hill or upon the mount, right? And this was actually typical for prophets to do, like during they called the sign prophets during the time of Jesus. Jesus may have actually inspired this whole group of sign prophets, or he was just one of them. It depends on uh, how you want to follow the evidence. But either way, 
this was pretty typical. And so what makes the most sense of Luke's convoluted journey is actually that it's Jesus's journey. And Jesus is placing himself there as an Elijah-like prophet. He's following the journey of Elijah from the Old Testament uh, as he took over Elijah's ministry when Elijah was taken to heaven. And Luke is tapping into a tradition just like this. And what's really neat about it is that the way that we are able to see this journey is by looking at this undesigned connection between Luke and John's gospel. So it's not planned by Luke, you know, it's very subtle, but we, it gives us a little insight into how, uh, how Luke is tapping into traditions that are historical. And it also explains a strange feature of Luke's text at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. Just some of the events like uh, when Jesus is up uh, north there in Samaria and the disciples, they're not very welcome, you know, Jews, Samaritans, so forth. So the disciples said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire on them? Well, yep. obviously they were aware of Elijah and the same region area uh, where the king has uh, sent 50 men and a captain out to Elijah and says, you know, the king wants you to come to him, man of God. And Elijah says, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven. And yep. fire comes down from heaven. Another company comes, a repeat of that. Uh, if I be a man of God, let fire come down the third time. Uh, you know, yeah. third time's the charm. The guy says, oh, man of God, please have mercy on me and so forth. And Elijah, uh, Elijah, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, goes. So, you know, those that is just one. There's two others that you pick up in there. But uh, yep. the uh, the even the wording of how... Uh, when um, the mother's child died and was raised from the dead. And th I think it was the words, now correct me, he gave the child back to his mother or something like that. And, mm -hmm. and the, the same, that same wording was used uh, with the, the funeral procession that Jesus stopped. And, and yep. yeah, it just, I just found that very fascinating. Yep. And in that particular case, it, it's actually like a verbatim, uh, parallel to the Greek Old Testament. So it's a definitely, it's a very strong allusion there to that, to the Elisha narrative there where, yeah, but it's a verbatim copy. So yeah, there's, there's quite a few examples of Luke being influenced by this tradition. So it all, it all works out together. So you have all these random pieces that make no sense, but then when you put them all together, oh, actually this is like perfectly clear what's going on. So that's kind of a cool that was like a little side project that I did uh, during my research that I thought was really fascinating and I wanted to put it in the book. And so I'm glad you picked up on that. Yeah. Oh, it's just fascinating. And uh, the, uh, the comparison when uh, Elijah throws his mantle on Elisha and Elisha says, Hey, you know, give me a minute. Let me go tell my mom and dad goodbye. You know, let me, let me do all this. And Elijah says, go, go ahead. But that very same thing, people are coming to Jesus, said, you know, I'll follow you wherever you want to go, and uh, I'm with you. And he says, well, foxes, you know, have hole, and birds of the air have nests. Son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Another one speaks up and says, Lord, I want to come follow you, and but I got to go to a funeral. I got to bury my dad. And, mm -hmm. and he says, let the dead bury the dead. And yep. you know, another one comes and he says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I think it's Luke 9, 62 or 52, yep. some, somewhere in there. And uh, But I thought that was so interesting as well, just another uh, Elisha-like. And, and, and also, uh, <clears throat> I thought it was interesting. You know, you think law and grace and so forth. You think, oh, you know, Jesus, give, cut him a little slack. You know, the guy's dad died and, you know, let him go do that. It, but Jesus was like so focused. It was like, you know, no, you know, the kingdom of God, come follow me. Whereas yeah. Elijah, you know, you would think more law and now, you know, I don't have time for you. You know, if you're going to go tell your parents, your mom and dad, goodbye, you know, forget about it. And, and, but I just found that contrast really great. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that's another one of the three uh, allusions there in the beginning of the travel narrative, the one you mentioned, because, you know, you have Elisha, he was working with his plow, you know, when, when, when Elijah, when Elijah called him, 
And then Elijah said, yeah, can I go say goodbye to my mom and dad? And Elijah's like, yeah, go ahead. And so you have this the combining of, of saying goodbye to your parents and, you know, getting and, and plowing the field. And so you can see how Jesus is combining his illusions together. But in this case, to provide a contrast, like you mentioned, and I think that's indicating that whereas Elijah was okay with Elisha doing that, Jesus was not because Jesus is up to something even more important than what Elijah and Elisha were up to. So, yeah, yeah, very cool little connections there in the travel narrative. Yeah, it is. I think so many uh, Christians fail to uh, study the Old Testament, and it's just so rich with the new. I mean, it's just, it's, it's beautiful. But anyway, moving on, I, um, patterns of style. Let's get into patterns of style. Okay. Well, this would be a good segue then into this, because um, so when you look at the language of Luke, you know, the Luke has this reputation of being a very like Hellenistic, very Greek uh, writer, you know, the most, you know, the only Gentile writer of the New Testament. And what's really surprising then is that certain portions of Luke's gospel are actually very Semitic, Semitic being like they're, they're influenced by like a Hebrew or an Aramaic, like a Jewish and a style of uh, the way that language is is phrased, like the syntax and vocabulary of, of Luke's language. It's not very polished Greek at all. In fact, it's very Jewish. Um, and so what can account for that? And one theory is that Luke is writing in the style, in certain portions of his gospel, in the style of the Old Testament, like in the style of his Greek Bible that he was used to. That's one theory. Another theory, and, and it's, it's likely a combination of these, right, as, as history is always messy like this. It's also possible that Luke is taking oral accounts and he's translating them very woodenly. Or it's possible that Luke is either translating Hebrew material himself or somebody else has translated this Hebrew material and Luke is taking it on. So though you have those, those theories going on. But what's really what's interesting for the eyewitness aspect of it is that when you look at all these Semitic features in Luke's text, they cluster around where Luke names a person in his text and seems to take on like their perspective. And so that then corresponds with either Luke himself highlighting the eyewitness testimony and giving it like a kind of like a gravitas, like giving it. Uh, so like when you would read Luke's account, it would read like like the Bible to someone reading Luke's gospel. It would read like the Hebrew text in the language. It's almost like, Luke is going from normal colloquial language like you and I to King James in like certain portions. And those are the very portions where Luke switches from like a King James more archaic uh, style. Those are the places where Luke has his eyewitnesses present. So that would be like one way to account for that. Of course, another way is simply to say, well, these accounts that are focused on named persons are more Semitic because Luke is actually taking on oral testimony from Aramaic speakers or from uh, Hebrew notes or, 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 you know, pieces of information, written traditions that Luke received. But all, all in all, it points to this convergence of Semitic, so like more Jewish material and named eyewitnesses that Luke seems to be tapping into. And that's the, that's the third tell. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you mentioned like using the what the locals referred to, I believe you use the example of the Sea of Galilee and, and Luke is calling it the Lake Genesaret. Right. Yeah. So that would, yeah. So that would be like tapping already into our fourth tell because I kind of build on. So the third tell simply notes the convergence of named persons and Semitic language. And then the fourth tell adds another element to that. And it, it, what it observes is in these places where you have a named person and you have more Semitic Greek, you also tend to have little historical nuggets that can be verified that reflect like a localized perspective. And so you mentioned, yeah, you mentioned uh, the Lake Gennesaret with, with Peter. Uh, so, and also these places where Luke adds this historical detail and it's more Semitic and there's a named person, Luke also tends to vary a little bit from Mark's gospel. I believe, like most scholars, that Luke used Mark's gospel or a form of Mark's gospel as a template. And so you can see in certain places where Luke changes from his outline that he does these things. And so they, you mentioned the calling of the disciples. Mark's version is really short. 
I think it's kind of like, you know, Jesus is walking by the sea. He tells, he tells, you know, Simon, Peter and, and the boys, you know, hey, drop your nets. We're going. And like, OK, we'll follow everything. You know, we'll, we'll follow you. And it seems really abrupt. And I, I had a sense that Luke felt the same way. And so Luke's account is much longer and it focuses on Peter. So here's a named person it's focused on. It focuses on this miraculous catch of fish that Peter witnesses. Peter is talking with Jesus. Luke talks about how Peter feels about it, how Peter is responding to it, how in response to this miracle, Peter sees Jesus as being the Lord. And so it all provides context for like why someone would drop everything and follow Jesus. So you have that element of it, the named person, and it's more Semitic in this area. And like you mentioned, Luke changes the name of the Sea of Galilee to to the Lake of Gennesaret. And so what Josephus tells us is that this is actually what the locals call this body of water. So they didn't call the lake the Sea of Galilee. There might be a theological reason behind why Matthew, Mark, and John refer to it that way. But Luke goes out of his way and says, no, I'm going to call this by the historically situated name, the Lake of Gennesaret. And so you have these convergences around named persons. So so what I envision here, for example, is that Luke, he had Mark's account, you know, which we, he knew, you know, went back to Peter. And he thought, you know, I want to dig into this a little bit more and do a little bit of, you know, a little bit of work as an investigator. And so he went to Peter. And while talking with Peter, he realized Peter refers to the lake in a particular way, like the locals do. Peter adds all this detail. And so you see all this coming together then in Luke 5, where Luke is recording this event with Peter. And so that convergence of historical nuggets that can be verified, changes from Mark, Semitisms and name persons, they all cluster around where Luke seems to have gotten eyewitness material from his interviews. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit too about the semitisms i learned a whole lot about that with with the book sure yeah so there's various types of semitisms in luke's text so sometimes it'll be uh in the way that the greek is phrased so in 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 hebrew uh for example if you're introducing language you can be kind of redundant in what you say so you might be like um and talking uh, and beginning to speak, you know, Peter said so-and-so. And so rather than just saying, like, Peter spoke, you have this, like, redundancy of, like, oh, beginning to speak, Peter said, you know. And so Luke takes that redundancy, and it's also present in his gospel in several places. So that's just, like, a matter of syntax. Sometimes uh, Luke will have particular names that are, like, a bit more Semitic. So um, one example that's kind of fun is Mary's name. In the infancy narrative, I talk about this too, where Luke seems to be taking on like a he like a Hebrew or Jewish tradition. And so in in Luke chapter one and two, uh, especially chapter two, but also chapter one, Luke refers to Mary as Miriam. So this doesn't this doesn't communicate in our English Bibles, but in the original Greek, uh, very likely this is a Jewish tradition. So Mary would have been called Miriam rather than Maria, which was her Greek form. So typically a Jewish person, obviously they're living, you know, one foot's in the Jewish community, one foot's in their Greek community, right? They're living in this bilingual culture, even trilingual. But so typically they had a, a Hebrew name or a Jewish name, and then they had a Greek name. And so Mary would have had a Hebrew name, Miriam, and a Greek name, Maria. And so when you look at the infancy narrative that Luke likely received as like a tradition, he clearly has received like a Jewish tradition and calls Mary Miriam consistently, except in one place where Luke has a very personal comment about Mary and says that Mary, you know, what is it? She pondered all these things, you know, uh, treasuring them in her heart or, or the other way around. But it's, it's, it's personal insight into Mary that Luke seems to capture. And it's in this place and this place only where Luke uses Mary's Greek form of her name, the way that he would have known her by, because obviously Luke is a, is, is a Gentile Greek speaker. And so here you see how like a little change in how Luke treats Semitic language can, can tip us off to Luke having unique personal insight into a tradition. So here, it's not merely that Luke passively receives this tradition about Mary, it's that Luke passively receives a Jewish tradition, but then also inserts his own commentary from his interview and in that very comment, you have a little change. In this case, going from a a more Semitic to a more Greek variant of Mary's name, because Luke is writing it in his own personal style rather than relaying traditional material. 
So there's all kinds of stuff like that in Luke's text. Um, Luke's gospel is is really perhaps the most Semitic. And, and so there's some scholars who think that Luke may have taken over a lot of material, like translated material from Jerusalem when he met with James, possibly. Or like I mentioned earlier, perhaps Luke is writing his gospel when he focuses on the eyewitnesses in the style of the Old Testament. So we mentioned that how like in the Elijah narrative, Luke is verbatim quoting the Greek Old Testament there about uh, the widow in Nain. So I think there's a, combina there's a combination of that going on. But it's just really surprising that the most Greek, most polished, most educated uh, Gentile author of the New Testament has a lot of this Semitic language in it. And the best way to explain that is either, I think it's a combination of Luke receiving traditional material and also relaying it in the style of the Old Testament to give it extra weight and authority when he's talking about eyewitnesses. Hmm. Yeah, really good stuff. Um, yeah, so getting kind of long here. Um, what what does uh what do you want people to take away from from this book? What would you like to to see people gain from this? And yeah, I think I think one thing is just a general sense of the authenticity of the Gospels and Acts. Um, I think that's that's probably the main thing, and especially Luke. You know, I think also, um, I think it's helpful for people to see the Gospel of Luke, for example, in the book of Acts as being historical reportage. I think it's very valuable to see to see the Gospels as, of course, as as God's authoritative word. That's what it is, right? It, it's it's God's gift to us, to for us to know him. And that's kind of like a top down approach, you know, but I think it's also helpful sometimes to have kind of like a bottom up approach where we can also be confident that when we excavate kind of into the riches of this text, it is also like historically real, you know, it's authentic. It's, it fits into the situation. And that's what distinguishes it from like other ancient mythologies or even uh, historical fictions. You know, it, it's the real stuff of history. And so I want people to um, get an impression of that as well. And, uh, I think lastly, just for people to realize there's so many riches in the texts of the New Testament, especially in the Gospels. There's so much to dig into there. So like what I do in my book, I try to make my book as short as I could. Um, I didn't want to, you know, bore people to death. It's there's so, there's so much more that there's so much more there, you know. And I want people to to get an impression that, wow, there's a lot here. You know, there, there's deep roots in this text. And uh, that's what I've loved about my journey through my research is that it really gives you an appreciation for how well rooted the New Testament is in its historical context. And it gives you a rich, it gives you a sense of the richness of the New Testament. Yeah, I think you, you say that Luke was, Luke realized that he was writing more than just a historical account. He was writing scripture. He was writing theology. Uh, he was writing the story of God. Yes. Yeah. And that's what I, I talk about that a bit toward the end of my book. Cause that of course is so, so deep when you realize that with Luke, that Luke, yeah, he's not just writing about the historical man, Jesus. He's, he's actually giving us a biography of what God is like. You know, it isn't, it isn't just that like in Luke's gospel, it isn't just that Luke is answering the question of who Jesus is with the answer that Jesus is Yahweh. It's also really that Luke is answering the question of what is Yahweh like with the answer, well, Yahweh is like Jesus, you know, and I want to, because that's just as radical and it changed the way that I think Luke oriented his ethics, that Luke and, and ultimately the world, the way that we see the world today is influenced by this view of God coming in the person of Jesus with all that radical grace and, and, and love that that involves and and, and the subversion of power involved in that. And so that's an element of it too, which I tap into a little bit at the end of the book. So um, there's a lot going on in Luke's gospel. Luke was, you know, I put this this documentary together with Cameron Bertuzzi recently on my book. And going through that process actually made me realize how difficult it is to put together uh, a narrative, like a story that is true, but also that people can sit through and not be bored out of their minds about that's consistent 
and that's clear. And I think that really helped me appreciate what the gospel authors did too. And Luke, especially Luke is taking all these different testimonies from all these individuals and he's weaving it together at the same time. He has a consistent story of who Jesus is. He's telling us some really deep things about what God is like through the person of Jesus and he's being faithful to his sources. And so, yeah, I try to communicate that truth in the book as well, because that's of course a really fascinating element of the gospels that I think people sometimes don't appreciate. You know, they don't appreciate how deep the gospels really are. So yeah, it's good that you brought that up too. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, I could talk to you all day here. Uh, uh, how, if our viewers want to reach out to you, how would they connect with you and find resources that you have available? Uh, they can just go to my website, uh, lukevandaway.com, and they can reach out to me there. Um, and I'm happy to share materials with them that I got my daughter walking by. I, mean, I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, they reach out to me on my website. You know, a lot of my articles are actually available for free, too. They're really technical, but I have them on my web page um, so they can read those and but yeah, they can always feel free to reach out via my webpage, and I'll typically respond within a day. And I try to stay on top of all my emails. So. All right. Well, we'll certainly put that in the show notes, put a link to you, uh, not only the historical tale of your book, but to your other books as well. And uh, certainly appreciate your time today, uh, Luke, and thanks for the insight, and thank you for writing this. And as a real blessing, and uh, uh, just like I said, just really love the book. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me on, and and I appreciate all your questions and taking the time to read it. And I'm I'm glad to hear that people are getting some stuff out of the book, you know. So it's great. <laughs>